Hello there and welcome to the Construction Revolution Podcast. My name is Ali Alizadeh and here on the show we explore the latest trends, technologies, people and organizations that are revolutionizing or disrupting the construction industry and are changing what the industry will look like tomorrow. Today on the show I'm speaking with Vincent Albanese, the Manager of Strategic Partnerships for North America at Cobod, and Ian Arthur, the President and Founder of Nidus 3D. Cobot is the world leader in 3D construction printing solutions, with their BOT2 printer being used on projects around the world. Their vision is to bring 3D printed and robotics constructed buildings to every city around the world. Through partnerships with companies such as Nidus 3D, they are making this vision a reality. Nidus 3D is using BOT2 printer on projects throughout Canada, including the first of its kind residential 3D printed project in the country. Today we're going to cover a very interesting topic, and that's concrete 3D printing. And uh, we have um, two industry leaders who are uh, trying to push the boundaries of uh, science and technology to make the 3D printing happen in the concrete industry and the construction market. And uh, before we begin, uh, let's just start with the introduction. Uh, perhaps we can start with you, Ian. Uh, thanks, and thanks for having me on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Ian Arthur, and I'm the president and founder of Nidus 3D. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having us on there. Very, very exciting to see what you guys got going on for the industry. Um, my name is Vincent Albany. I've been with Cobot for about a year now. I always make the joke I was the first American for the company. But yeah, I deal a lot with all the, the partners and customers from customers to universities to even helping set up our, our U.S. office awesome. in, in South Florida. Great to have you both on the show. Um, before we get to the actual question, so one one big question, uh, you know, for the people who are not familiar with the 3D printing, is that what is concrete 3D printing and how does it work in the in the con- construction industry? So, Ian, uh, maybe you can in layman's person uh, 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 terms uh, explain how does it work for for our audience. Uh, we we get asked this question all the time, and we we. The first thing we do is point people to 3D printers that they might be more familiar with. The, the little ones that some folks have in their garage or workshops or that you've definitely seen in universities. And then we ask them to imagine that a thousand times bigger. Uh, it's the, the Cobot system is a huge gantry system, uh, with an extrusion nozzle. But what we're extruding is concrete instead of a polymer or a metal filament that, that would come out of a smaller one. And the, the, the method is very, very similar. You're layering concrete one layer at a time, uh, in an automated fashion and slowly layer by layer, you'll see a building come up from the ground. That's, uh, that's very interesting. So, Winston, what is your, uh, description of, uh, concrete 3D printing? Yeah, Ian, Ian kind of nailed it for the most part. I mean, if you look at the small 3D printing, that's kind of where you get your scale. Uh, but if you actually look at the process, the way I explain it to people, it's like laying, uh, icing on a cake. That's basically what the printer is doing. It's laying layer by layer on top of each other. Um, eventually you're going to be able to get your monolithic look on the side. Uh, but yeah, basically what we did is we, we took it small 3D printing and we kind of blew it up. For the most part, I still have sometimes, you know, talking to people and explaining to them, I say I 3D print houses. They still think small, small, like plastic houses, but then I show them pictures and they're amazed. And to be honest, sometimes it breaks their brain, but then you have to kind of dive into really what that's, the process looks honestly, like. Honestly, that's almost universal feedback when people finally see in person. We've done so many presentations of the technology and and there there is a remarkable difference to showing it to someone on a TV screen or something like that than having them arrive on site and watch them crank their neck all the way up to the sky and this thing is huge. <laughs> that, that's great. And, uh, I, I understand that the 3D printing uh, in the concrete industry has come a long way from equipment, tools, materials. Uh, specifically on the materials, uh, what are the advancements that have been made uh, to make sure that you know, these layers are um, uh, poured as easily as possible and are <clears throat> set as quickly as possible so that it's ready for the next layer uh, to be um, uh, laid. 
Yeah, so this is a this is a kind of a, a big topic around the industry because for, for most people, when they think about 3D construction printing, they just see the printer. They think that's it. You just click a button and, and it starts building a house for you. But I mean, people forget kind of the material side, which is, to be honest, a little bit more important than the gantry system itself. The technology with the gantry system is nothing new. It's been around since the 80s. But what we're doing with concrete is, is completely different. So to, to set up precedence, there's two types of materials used in the industry. Um, there's mortar and there's concrete. If you ask people what's the difference, is they'll say basically the aggregate size. Concrete uses a, a little bit more aggregate size. Uh, but for 3D construction, they're actually completely different. So when you look at a mortar, a mortar makes will be a mix made, let's just say, in a factory, and it's going to have admixtures and additives built into the product already. So all you're going to do is you're going to take the mortar mixer, your cement powder, put it in a silo, and you can mix water to it. Um, that's kind of where the industry started because it was super easy to go that route. But when you look at the overall cost of dry mix mortar, you're picturing 450 all the way up to $800 a cubic yard. We're trying to build cheaper here and more. Yeah. So we're trying to build cheaper here. So what Cobod discovered about two and a half years ago was, hey, we can actually make real concrete. So that involved two parts that that involved one, making a batch plant that can mix the concrete for mobility and on size demand. And that was creating the, the DFAB solution with Cemex. Um, so the DFAB sol- solution with Cemex is really what makes the concrete 3D printable. It has accelerants, plasticizers, super plasticizers, so the con- concrete can make its form and then cure quick enough so when the printer comes around for the next layer, you don't have to worry about the falling layer. Uh, and getting the yet. timing between those two layers is, is so important. We do all sorts of calculations on that when we go out. So Nidus uh, exclusively uses the concrete printers for a lot of reasons, and I'll get into a few of them. But not you need to find this perfect uh, point in time where you've measured your layer time and it's soft enough that you have consolidation between layers, that you have the one layer adhering to the one below it, but strong enough that you're not having compaction and, and having the wall kind of uh slide down or, or collapse underneath the weight of the new layer so you know nailing that that exact mixture and how much uh add mixture needs to be in in the mix at any given time it, it's challenging but we but it's it's definitely manageable and we found our key operators uh have just significantly increased their ability to to recognize what needs to be done at any given point in time they're very interesting to optimize that time of pouring, so to speak. Um, and from materials perspective, I think Vincent, you mentioned uh, some specialty mixes, uh, but from practical perspective, Ian, uh, do you think that these materials are readily available? In a, in a, one of the advantages of concrete, regular concrete is that aggregate sand, cement, water is readily available everywhere in the world, and that's why concrete is so popular. But when it comes to 3D printing concrete, you have, as you mentioned, there are specialty mixes. Uh, from availability perspective, how does it work? Can you do 3D printing everywhere in the world? Uh, we can because we, we print in concrete and we made the conscious decision not to use the mortar mixes, uh, from a cost perspective and an availability, uh, perspective. Canada is a massive country with a population that is spread out over a huge area. And so we have, we have ambition to go into remote communities with this technology and deploy housing in communities that are very difficult to build in traditionally. And one of the key factors for us to be able to do that is being able to source those materials locally. Uh, we're, we're based outside of Toronto, but we want to move into the West Coast, BC, Vancouver in the near future. And if we had a source of, of mortar in Ontario, uh, the logistics of, of making sure we could access that in, in BC are almost insurmountable. Whereas high quality sand, uh, spec'd aggregate, Portland cement, and then the admixtures that come from Cobod are all readily available. Mm -hmm. And and that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to make sure that the material, not just the gantry system itself was on demand, but the material system was on demand itself. Because our batch plant, that's what you're going to do. You're going to source your raw material, your sand, your aggregate, your cement, 
your water and you're gonna you're gonna batch it on site. Um, the admixture we use from Cemex is only one percent of the actual material, so ninety nine percent of it is is raw material. And the nice thing with Cemex, Cemex is a is a global company, so we can get their additives all over the world. But by by doing this with concrete, we've been able to achieve you know whatever your average price of concrete is. I know for at least the U.S. it's around one hundred dollars to one hundred and fifteen. Fifteen dollars a cubic yard. Well, now we're able to meet those 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 prices because we can batch the concrete on site, and then we also don't have to worry about people bringing it on site, logistics costs, and things like it, that. The well. technology, when you have that price equivalency in the materials that are going into this, uh, we actually have a price advantage over other companies that are using mixed concrete because we only mix the exact amount that we need. We are operating with three to 5% waste. And most of that's what's left in the hose at the end of the night that we have to pump out. So we're, we're only ma mixing exactly what we need. We don't have to, you know, you, you can't really order a third of a truck of concrete to be delivered to site. You order everyone over orders concrete and then they just dump whatever's left or they have alternative uses for it, usually back making, you know, uh, traffic pylons or, or whatever it is that they need to do, not the pylons, but the dividers uh, with the leftover concrete at the end of every day. But 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 that's almost paid for twice. When you spec out a concrete order for a job, you, everyone traditionally over orders. We mix exactly the amount we need for every job and no more. So that's very interesting. On the same topic, uh, the quality of construction is obviously key in getting structural, I think, performance met, and at the end of the day, get uh, occupancy permit for the uh, for that particular structure. And um, the quality and performance um, evaluation has been well established for regular red and mixed concrete. The type of test that you would do: slump test, air test, strength test at different ages. How does the quality you know, in general, uh, work or quality assessment work for the 3D printing concrete. And what are the test methods that have been developed or standardized to ensure that the quality of the final product uh, meets the performance criteria that is set for that particular 3D printer structure? Um, I don't know, Ian, maybe you would like to start. Since you've been working with GCs, uh, you know, obviously they have uh, very strict rules on their performance criteria. Yeah, so an another, I think, advantage of the concrete ap approach uh, to 3D printing is that we're, we developed a mix profile that is, uh, in Canada, the authority is CSA. That's a CSA approved mix. Uh, the, the mix that we are printing is no different than the mix that is being used in, you know, all over the place in, in concrete based construction. So we're, we're not doing anything particularly different. What we're doing is placing that material in a different way. And we really do emphasize that from, from a code perspective that this is masonry construction. We have been building masonry buildings for thousands of years. And uh, I actually just pulled out my phone to have a look because we just got results back from our, our 28 day tests on the material that we deployed on our last uh, job. So we, we do a, we, we take a sample every day. We turn on the printer for compression testing. We do the slump testing of the mix ahead of time and, and know where it needs to be for printing and everything. So we hit uh, 48.68 MPA on the first day. Uh, we sped up the printing process on the second day and uh, the MPA did drop, but it only dropped to 42.31. Still very high. 40. That's around 5,000 PSI to all the Americans listeners. <laughs> so that's around 5,000 PSI. There you go. PSI yeah. Sorry. I need the translation. Listening. Thanks, Vinny. But, but that's really high. I mean, the building standard is 32. <laughs> so we're exceeding it uh, significantly. And uh, we think we can improve on it even even more as as we figure out. Uh, you know, we're we're taking one of the amazing things about three D construction printing is it's taking data and applying it to a sector that really has not been data driven in in a really significant way in a long time. So we're collecting data on every layer that we print. We can measure you know what the temperature was when that layer was placed. So if if we run into failures, if we run into things, we can go back and drill down and find out exactly what variable was different from one layer to the next and identify those and and be able to standardize and correct those over the long term uh very very easily. Very interesting. And, and Vincent, is it from, from robotics perspective, what are types of uh, maybe sensors that you would use to monitor um, the whole operation? 
Yeah, so, you know, to, to preference, my background was in mechatronics engineering. So I was in university right when the industrial 4.0, IoT, right when that was kicking off. So I've spent some time in advanced manufacturing, Amazon plants, Ford, you name it. So I've kind of seen what technology is out there. And Ian made a, a good point that construction is so old, it's very hard to study. Why? Because there's there's no data behind it. So there's things that you can do from you know the entire life cycle. One, you could put sensors on the printer to understand how you're printing, uh, visual sensors, AI, that kind of stuff to understand the print and the quality control while you're going with it and creating the algorithms behind there. And then you can take the sensors to the bash plan as well. To how do we automate that process as well by adding humidity sensors, temperature sensors. So as concrete as the day changes, as the heat and the environment changes, your concrete mix is going to change as well. So how do we automate that process? And then we're looking at you know some of some of the other cool stuff like VR and AR. Like I have a, a setup right now where I'm able to put my virtual re virtual reality goggles on see the full size of a printer right now we're just using that for demo purposes but we want to use that for training and then we also want to use that for remote operations um, i know they use remote operations for large manufacturing plants already so there's there's no reason why you know ian can't be in ontario and doing a project let's just say in toronto or windsor canada and not being able to kind of see the full aspect of how his machine is operating on any given day and we work with very large, one, one key is we, we work with very large industrial automation brands as well. So people like the Rockwells and the Siemens of the world, they have that technology already created. It's just a matter of, hey, how do we convert it to the construction aspect? Awesome. That, that's amazing. And, um, you know, Vincent, maybe on the same line, I mean, you, you mentioned about the, the key elements in your technology and how you're uh, automating the whole process. You know, and I uh, understand that bought two printers will both best selling 3D printer or concrete, and what makes it uh, so popular? Yeah, so for the most part, you know, I'm going to take, a, I was thinking about this answer, and we'll take a little different approach, but for the most part, what has made us so, so successful is our partners. You know, people like Ian at Nidus from our investors at GE, Perry, and Cimex. Um, without our customers actually taking the challenge with us and exploring different applications and different theories with that, we can evolve it, which leads me to that second point is, you know, we are one of very few, if not one of like the only 3D construction companies that are doing real projects in the wild. And we've done it on all six continents from schools in Africa to, you know, three story apartments in Germany to Canada and North America, all the way to South America and Australia as well. So we really have a global presence and basically we're able to take feedback very well and adapt to technology. You know, for the most part, a lot of people are going to all start on the same level field and come across the same challenges. The nice thing is we have so many customers that we get constant feedback that we're able to adapt, not just the machine, but the material and everything else that kind of goes with it. And thirdly, it's kind of the, the people that, that drive the company. I mean, Ian, Ian could tell you it's a lot of it's some of the smartest people in the world I've ever worked with, but it's a lot of young, driven professionals that really want to make a difference in this world and really want to create an impact and some change in one of the most outdated, oldest industries in the entire world. That's, uh, that's amazing. And, and you also have a product called Cobot Mini Bench Plant. Uh, how, how does this product work with the Bot 2 printer? Yeah, so that was the batch plant we were talking about that enables right. us to make concrete. Um, so that's the, that's the first in its kind. Actually, mini, mini, mini batching is actually pretty uncommon in the concrete world because you're usually doing, you know, tons and tons of concrete pours. So we, we work with a vendor that has been able to create this batch plant specifically for mini batching, but more specifically for 3D construction. And, um, and Ian, from your perspective, you've probably work with other 3D printers or you're, you know, you're familiar with the other technologies in the market. What makes um, Cobot so special that you have uh, selected them to be their exclusive partner and uh, use their technology for 3D printing? I, I think I would echo some of what uh, Vincent said in that it was real world examples of this technology being used by third parties successfully. And you can look out at other companies that are will be entering the market and, and have their printers out there, and they're just not there yet. Our, our estimation was that Cobot was three to five years ahead of anyone else in this space. And having visited them in Denmark, uh, we think that's going to continue because they they have their second generation printer in market being deployed on a large scale and are working on the next round of improvements 
uh, that while everyone else is still trying to get those printers deployed in the first place into the field. So they, they have a huge leg up, I think, on, on the competition. Uh, I think the support from the company is fantastic and was fantastic from the very beginning. So from the first point in time, we reached out to Cobot. Uh, they have been supported. They have a 24-7 uh, support line that you can access uh, globally, So, uh, which is fantastic. And then the, the, the whole idea, which Vincent also touched on, of of all these different groups that are running into similar problems or different challenges. And there's a lot of communication between between people with Cobot printers. And so we end up on calls with folks from Australia or down in the States or England uh, and Great Britain talking about, you know, what did you, oh, we ran into that too. Oh, what was your solution? This was our solution. And so we're, we're, we are at the very forefront of a brand new industry. And when you talked about testing standards and stuff like that, I kind of laugh because it, it's really internal right now because a lot of those international standards are currently being developed. And it's actually these companies deploying this technology in the field and taking those tests and working with universities and governments that are going to create all of that. And the nomenclature, how we actually refer to the different parts of 3D printing. Uh, we're, we get to be a part of that at the very front end and, and working with Cobot to do that. We, we're going to define an entire sector as, as a group using those printers and, and with Cobot as a manufacturer. Actually, continuing on that topic in a, in a way, uh, I would love to hear more about the project, uh, the residential project that you completed in Canada. Yeah. And as you mentioned, there's a, still a lot of standards being developed or guidelines developed for 3D printing uh, of concrete structures. And yet you were able to uh, work collaboratively together and with the general contractor to complete this multi-residential yeah. structure and get occupancy permit at the end of the day. And we all know construction industry is not that open to adopting new technologies because of all the liabilities that are associated if something goes wrong. I would love to hear how that project was started. How does how did the GC said, okay, I'm going to try 3D printing a technology and uh, you work together to make it happen? So I, I think it's that's a really, really good question. I think at the very beginning of it was was the, that the general contractor or the, or the project leader in this case was Habitat for Humanity. And they have been working with Cobot printers on multiple continents and multiple countries for quite a while. And that partnership, having an organization like Habitat for Humanity wanting to embrace a new technology honestly goes a long way because then it's not just Nidus 3D, you know, approaching building inspectors with building designs. It's, we've got the sort of weight of, of a, a globally recognized uh, affordable housing institution that that can lend uh, their pull to, to making getting these projects to go ahead. Now, that's not to say that we uh, cut, cut any corners or anything like that, but it's just getting in the room and getting them to listen. And really what it is, is a, it's a collaborative process. It's okay, we want to put up this structure. What are the things that we need to incorporate to get to the place where we do get residency permits? Uh, the Leamington project, which is the one you're referring to, was also a partnership with the University of Windsor, uh, which has one of the best concrete labs in, in Canada. And so they had been doing testing on 3D printing for a year before we actually started deploying this concrete on site. So they had a lot of data that they were relying on, um, which, which helped us do it. And, and I think a willing partner in the municipality. So the building inspectors or the chief building officer wanted to work to get this thing done and figure out what we had to put in place to do it. Our approach from the very beginning for these proof of concept and early projects has been to not actually rely on printed material to be structural. Uh, technically, if you really looked at these projects, I think they would count as the windbreak. And we add additional traditionally poured columns to support roof structures and floors. And we engineer those columns to be able to take the entirety of the weight of those multiple stories. And we're printing around them. So it's, it's an extra added feature. Uh, it adds a little bit of cost, but not a significant amount of cost to the project. And it has allowed us to work with engineers and building officials to make sure that we do get to a place where, where these can be permitted. Are there people living in uh, staying in that building today? Not quite. Uh, we're getting okay. there. Uh, there's been uh, the biggest delay on that one so far has actually been the type of low expansion foam that they're insulating with uh, was suddenly unavailable, as the story is in so many places, sectors right now. Uh, so there's a bit of a delay on that. But but by early fall, yes, there will be people living in, in that 
building and amazing. Uh, That's amazing. We'll we'll also have our second project will be completed by early September as well and and fully finished. So we'll be able to provide updates on that too. That's amazing. And, and Vincent, you you work with other projects, other uh, contractors, and uh, you know in, in general you need to get the buy in from the contractor and also this uh, structural engineer on record. What are the common questions or hesitancies that are brought up by the uh, structural engineers in particular? Yeah, for for the most part, it just takes some edu educating because if you find like I've spoken, I've spoken with quite a bit of structural engineers, and once they kind of look at our drawings and look at some of the things we do, they realize they're not doing anything new. Concrete structures are built all over the world. This is more or less just a different form of pouring the concrete. So you know, sometimes when you lead the conversation, is we're three D printing concrete. Like I said, it could it could break the brains. But if you more just take it down to a base level, hey, we're using a tool to pour concrete to build concrete houses, and this is how concrete is going to perform. This is how the thermal the uh, insulation is going to perform. This is how you do windows. This is how you do load bearing walls. Once you just do a little educating, it immediately clicks. Uh, but then again, there is a there is a lot of liability behind it. Um, I mean, for the most part, my experiences with customers is you need a structural engineer to kind of get on board with you. And then the city, it'll be easier to get through the city processing and the building code, stuff like that. But, you know, it all starts at the technical level. So the more data we can have to back them up and the more use cases we can show them, the easier it is for not only for us to educate the engineers, but the industry as a whole. And, and what are the uh, some of the most interesting projects that you've worked on around the world? Yeah, I wish I could speak some of what we're working on right now. Unfortunately, you gotta gotta keep a little quiet. But uh, you know, to be honest, what we're doing with uh, GE is, is is pretty fascinating. And you know, not only the reason why it's fascinating too, because not only is it a, is it a new project, but we also had to create a new printer for that. So that printer that we built for GE, it's going to be sixty five foot by 60, 65 foot. So absolutely, you know amazing structure, a feat of engineering to say, but it's also the first dual access construction robot out there. So not only did it have a head for 3D printing, it has an automatic crane to insert rebar into the pedestals. So as the as the concrete tower is being printed, the printer head will move to the side, the crane will pick up the rebar and insert it itself. Um, no manual operations required for that. So that's a really cool project to show that, hey, you know, most people will say are going after the residential market, but the commercial and industrial sector is also something you can explore as well. Very interesting. What is the, I guess, maximum number of uh, stories that you can build, uh, say, two, three, four, using the 3D printing technology? Yeah. So right now, the farthest we've had tested was, was three floors. Um, with the bot XL that I just mentioned was 65 foot by 65 foot. In theory, you can go up to six to seven stories, but we haven't had, let's just say, a, a showcase example. We've yet. been uh, testing and pioneering what we call print in place lift in components, uh, where we, we actually print the veneers. We design them in a way where they're meant to fit together. And then we lift and, and place them with a crane, which has actually allowed us to do structures that are bigger than our printable area. We haven't used that to increase height yet, but we have a potential commercial customer right now looking at some warehouses that are well above the, the printable height of the printers that we're going to have. And uh, we're going to be testing over the winter if we can actually hit it. They want 40 feet of uh, ceiling height on these warehouses. And so we're going to be testing over the winter if we can print components and, and then uh, provide the sort of structural connections needed to be able to go that high with printed materials. So very, very exciting to be part of that. That, that's amazing. Apart from structures, uh, you know, commercial, residential, um, multi-story structures, do you see 3D printing technology used, for example, in the construction of bridges, perhaps, or other types of structures? Absolutely. And we, we've had a couple different groups approach us. And I think the only thing holding us back from executing it is the sort of data and testing data behind that. We, we can totally move into it. Anything I think that you would call either feature rich, or unique one off one off pieces the the printer is uniquely uh good at executing those projects traditionally uh if you you know you need a minimum uh unit yield uh to make a traditional form and fill it up for you know cisterns or whatever it is so if you have unique requirements and you only need one of them making the 3d model and then 3d printing it is far more feasible than than building a form 
And so we were approached by a group that uh, uh, runs uh, train stations. And for, fa- for safety, they need these secondary egress bridges or tunnels that go on and off tracks. But every single platform had different specifications. So no two bridges were going to be the same. And the cost per bridge with a traditional construction method would have been prohibitive. And so what we're exploring is even if we could just use our printed material as the form that they're pouring into, we can print those forms very quickly and efficiently and at low, uh, efficiently and at a low cost. And then we can pour the, put the reinforcement in and pour a traditional bridge and it, it performs based on the poured material, not on our forms. And so that would be a way for us to kind of move into that sooner before we have those sort of years of testing that are really required to, to get a new technology approved for infrastructure. And this is the this is the nice thing about being active on you know six continents is we have people like Ian and other customers to explore different applications. You know we we strictly know where we can fit in the situation. We are by far you know the most knowledgeable when it comes to three D construction. But we need our customers to go out there and to test the applications to make partnerships. You know one thing we keep talking about is standards and is why one reasons I work with a lot of universities because when we explore new applications, especially for things like construction because the reliability behind it, we need the testing. So universities have the resources that they could come in and they can do the research to help us create these new applications. That's, uh, that's amazing. And uh, uh, I think Ian referred to maybe tunnel construction. And we know today there's a, shot, a method called shot creep uh, in, the, you know, uh, in that uh, particular application. And I've seen robotic arms that are used to to basically apply shot create. Would you consider that a 3D printing method or by definition, it's not falling under 3D printing? I don't know, Vincent, you might be able to. Yeah, so, you know, what, what I would like to say, you know, one thing Cobot is doing, you know, we're, 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 we're branding, you know, not only as 3D construction, but we're also taking a different route right now where we're going to explore construction robotics. So how do we, you know, use a robotic arm to do stuff like that? That's whole let's say whole part of the whole construction robotics process, you know, 3d printing, it's, you know, let's just say by definition, it's, it's additive, it's layer by layer. But like I said, you know, that would be more of, Hey, what are, what are different applications like windows, doors, painting, drilling, insert rebar by itself. That's more of, let's just say like a construction robotic applications approach. And uh, maybe changing the sub subject a little bit. Do you, um, both have very interesting backgrounds that are not in the construction uh, industry. Uh, curious to know what uh, brought you to this industry and what's uh, fascinating you to continue your path and, and journey in the construction um, industry. I don't know, Ian, perhaps you can start first. <laughs> yeah, sure. So uh, just for the, for the listeners out there, the I think what you're referring to is uh, previous to founding NIDIS, I was actually a, a politician. Uh, at a, what would be a state level in, in the U.S., but it's, uh, they're usually full-time jobs up here. Um, uh, so making that transition, I, I was, I was fascinated, uh, from a policy perspective and there's a global housing crisis. We have a housing crisis in Canada. I know there's a housing crisis throughout the U.S. and in, in Europe as well. And, really kind of looking at what the policy recommendations were and realizing that none of them were going to adequately address the supply challenge we have on houses, that we had to fundamentally change how we are building if we were going to kind of step up to these challenges. Later, climate uh, change on top of that and the need to build climate resilient buildings, you know, adverse weather events are becoming more and more frequent. And the the stick frame wood buildings that are the standard are, are not going to be adequate that far into the future. We need to do things differently if we're going to prepare uh, from a climate resiliency perspective. So I think I was uh, looking at that and, and looking for technologies that I thought could meaningfully move the needle on the housing supply, be it affordable or, or otherwise, any any of it. We need tons of new commercial spaces uh, if we're going to keep the economies in, in any of these countries growing. So the demand was there, the need was there, and I felt that construction as a sector had the potential for significant disruption. It Materials have changed so much in the last hundred years. We are working with materials that no one could have dreamed of a hundred years ago. Um, spray foam insulation, gypsum board was, was a revolutionary when it came out. Uh, whatever it is that you want to look at, triple pane windows, higher efficiencies, the materials have changed. The processes have not. ICF are bigger bricks. 
They still have to be stacked. They still have to be tied together by labor. And what 3D construction printing does is it's the first technology I have seen that begins to fundamentally address the process problem. That, that the huge amount of the cost in, in building and uh, inability to provide affordable housing has to do with the processes. And I think 3D construction printing is the beginning of a process transformation that, that could help solve those issues that I was talking about. Thanks, Ian, for sharing uh, your take on the industry and also how your background, you know, make you come to this industry and uh, create a, a positive change uh, you know, for, for our future. Vincent, uh, you know, uh, we would love to hear about your background, how you came to the construction market. Yeah, you can kind of say construction is a little in my blood. Uh, I come from a, a long line of bricklayers, you know, my father, my grandfather, his father before him. Um, so it was, it was in my blood. I actually, when I went to Purdue, I did my undergrad at Purdue University. I actually started in construction management. And I, I was a sophomore at the time, and I got to intern with AECOM, which is the largest, you know, if not one of the largest construction companies in the entire world. And to be honest, I remember going in, you know, day after day, not one, you know, enjoying what I was doing, but two, looking at, you know, the people I was working with that have been in construction for a long time. And it was, hey, I have to get up for another day and go to work. Who wants to do that? Especially if you're a college kid paying all this money to get a college degree. Like I didn't want to live that lifestyle. So at, at that time, I took really just a reflection and I was able to change into mechatronics engineering, which is honestly, like I didn't know what I was getting myself into at the time, but little did I know Purdue University is like one of the largest in the world when it comes to industrial automation. They actually helped created the cybersecurity layer for Industry 4.0. So I got to go work for companies like Rockwell Automation, Siemens, ABB, you know, after college and during my internships. So I, I love manufacturing and I love where the technology was going. And to be honest, one day, you know, I saw a YouTube video of a, of a 3D printing construction robot. And for me, it, it immediately clicked because I knew my background and I knew where the industry was headed, that the technology is viable enough to, hey, this can actually, you know, do what it wants to do. So like I did, you know, I did research for six months, really tried to dig into it. And next thing you know, I was on my way to Copenhagen, Denmark, got to go work for Cobot. Um, and you know, it's, it's been, it's been a blast ever since I, you know, I get a lot of freedom to do what I do. Um, and I mean, really, if you're going to dream, dream big, you know, the construction industries is the largest in the entire world. So if you're going to make an impact, you know, why not start there, you know, from the projects we're doing in Africa to schools to, to really the impact it can have on an environmental, environmental and sustainability aspect too. I mean, it's really kind of where passion and purpose came together for me. Yeah. I think that's so important that being, you know, we are innovating on a daily basis. The Hugh, the other owner of Nidus 3D and myself, I mean, we show up in the office at absurd hours in the morning and we're excited to be there, you know, and, and the days are, are crazy long, but we are defining a sector right now. And that's such a unique opportunity. You don't get many chances like that in your life. So I, I think it's, it's just incredible to be part of this. I remember my, my first week in Copenhagen when I met Ian, he looked at me and he goes, man, you're lucky. You just got on board the next Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's that's uh, that's great. Uh, thanks thanks for sharing uh, the journey. Uh, you know, both of you, I think, uh, Ian, especially you, have touched on a point about environmental aspects. And, uh, and can you maybe elaborate a little bit more on how three D printing in the concrete industry can help with the environmental aspects, uh, whether it's material use or global uh, greenhouse gas emissions? For sure, and I think. You have to start with an acknowledgement of the carbon problem that concrete actually has. It's, it's a huge emitter. I think globally, the concrete industry would be like the seventh largest emitter in the world or something like that. Like it, it is significant in terms of the emissions it puts out there. And so I think fundamentally, we do have to examine the material that we're using and come up with new and innovative ways of lowering those emissions. I think that the tool of the printer, the BOD2, helps from some aspects of that. One is the lack of waste. So we are using and mixing only the, the exact amount of Portland cement we need. And Portland is really the thing that, that causes most of the emissions uh, that, that you're referring to. So I think that's important. I think by mixing on site, we're doing larger deliveries and keeping more trucks off the road. So there's 
sort of an inherent uh, environmental efficiency there. We're, we're burning less fuel to, to get product onto site because uh, we do a big delivery of sand aggregate. We maybe have one or two trucks that arrive at a site to finish an entire building, uh, which is pretty unique. So uh, I think those things, the, the nature of the efficient use of this technology is uh, a key aspect to why this has the potential to be uh, more environmentally friendly. Um, I think we have to, and there's a lot of smart people working on this, begin to look at uh, how we actually lower the carbon footprint uh, in the process of making Portland. And I know that there's some huge companies working on this. There's a Bill Gates uh, back startup that is working on a solar powered cement factory. So rather than needing to, to hit those temperatures solely with, with the burning of natural gas or, or whatever they are burning, they can do part of it with solar. So stuff like that, I think is key. I think introducing re recycled materials into it. And, and there's a recent uh, results of a study from a U.S. university that looked at recycled glass aggregates, which had looked like they had really sort of promising potential to be incorporated. I think that's really important. Um, that's on the materials side. And I'm talking a bit long here, but I, I want to touch on the performance side of it because I think that's the other part of this equation. We are building what we like to call multi-generational 100-year homes. And with very little additional cost, you can increase your uh, the cavity depth between those two veneers to whatever you need it to be to get, hit the environmental performance you're looking for. So if you want to hit lead platinum or, or passive house standards for insulation, we just make that cavity bigger. We introduce more insulation into that cavity and we can create buildings that are climate resilient because they're structurally strong. They're made out of concrete that are going to last significantly longer than any wood frame house. So if you look at the cost of replacement and the carbon associated with replacing homes more frequently, it's significant. And we can get them to a place where you could heat them with or cool them with very, very little energy. In Canada, we say that we call it, you know, heat it with a candle. Uh, it's kind of the dream that, that Canadians have because the, the, the costs are so high up here when it, get, when it gets real cold in the winter. So I, I think there's a lot of opportunity to, to get to a place where these are, you know, have the potential to be hopefully carbon neutral and, and maybe even get to a place where they're carbon negative. But uh, it's definitely one of the tasks we have ahead of us to figure out how to do that. I think, yeah, what you also refer to is, this, um, you know, you have a much tighter control over and consistency over the production in, in a, compared to the traditional red mix industry, where there's a lot of variability in the quality, even for the same concrete pour. Um, you know, that means that with a consistent production, you can optimize the amount of cement and material use. And you mentioned about uh, less waste at the end of the day uh, that are going to contribute the, uh, to the environmental aspects of uh, construction. Um, so uh, at the end, I would love to hear uh, your views on the future of the concrete 3D printing industry. This is, this is uh, as you mentioned, we've come a long way, but there's still a lot of things to do um, to make sure that we get the larger adoption and, and wider application of uh, 3D printed uh, concrete structures. Your view, what are your views on the future of 3D printing and what's going to happen in the short term and long term from your perspective, Vincent, maybe you can start first. Yeah, so there, there's probably three things, you know. The first one is just applications. I mean, right now, there has yet to be an application we explored where we say, hey, we, we can't do this. So the more applications we get from Cobot, the more we can explore. Really, the, the limitation is truly endless. Whatever your imagination can create, you know, at least let's explore the opportunity. Because, you know, it might not be viable now. Well, that's just because traditional methods don't make it viable. So how do we, how do we rethink and how do we have, you know, the industry and our customers rethink about design? Um, and then the second one, it's going to be material. You know, like I said, creating more sustainable environmental material. Uh, what goes along with that is my third is university and research. You know, the more research, the more testing and the more data we could provide to the industry, the more, let's just say, flexibility we're going to be able to have to explore new materials, new applications, new partnerships. Um, you know, additive manufacturing is let's just say well-known in general, let alone 3D construction. So the, the biggest thing that we can do right now is, you know, educate as much as possible. The more we can get out there, the more we can have people approach us and look at partnerships and look at collaborations and different opportunities. You know, as I just said, really, 
we're very optimistic about anything. You know, we have engineers to help us with structurals. If we have to redesign the printer, if we have to create a new printer to meet a specific applications, we'll go that route. So it's really, like I said, if people come to us and say, hey, I want to do that, we're always open for the challenge. I, yeah, same, same question. I, I think fundamentally it's the beginning of what I talked about earlier, which is a process change to, to how we build. And I, I would echo Vincent's sentiments in that there is near unlimited possibilities with where you can take this technology. So I think near term, the job is to get it deployed in as many different contexts as, as possible. And that really is linked to that education piece where we have to go out in the world and show people that this can be done. I think that we are at a point in time where there is a remarkably receptive sector uh, for this technology and a need from a, a political standpoint to, to find solutions to address the crises that we're facing. So I think we're at the right point in history to kind of introduce this process change. So I think that's really important. Uh, we expected, for instance, a lot more pushback from traditional builders, but there's such a shortfall of skilled laborers that they say, wait, you can do this with less people? Oh, okay, I'm interested. And that's only going to get worse. The baby boomer generation is retiring and exiting the trades and we do not have replacement bodies for them, no, nowhere near it. So, the, so that labor shortage over the next several years is only going to get worse. So we have to have solutions for it. So again, I think that's a sort of a near term. Long term, the efficiencies that this technology provides creates an opportunity to add on other efficiencies. You have this wonderful technology that places material layer by layer. So uh, he, Vincent was talking about the automated placement of rebar reinforcement. What we think is really important is understanding that between every single layer, you have a free point of interaction. A point of interaction, you don't have to drill. You don't have to core. You can place stuff between layers that can then interact with the other parts of the building for almost no additional cost to building. And so suddenly you're in this place of saying, okay, we're replacing this in, in a really cool way. What are the other systems that need to go into a home and how do they suddenly change how they interact because it's a 3D printed structure? And so I think that pushing the boundaries on what the printer can do and what Vincent talked about is really important. Then finding those other businesses or, or, or groups out there that want to take on other parts of the building envelope and figure out how they improve that section of it and bring all that together to a place where we can put up housing at a price that people can afford it. And in a time frame that isn't, you know, three and five years long sometimes. Yeah. And the, the really, just to add on that, the biggest hurdle that we're going to see right now is there's no life cycle for 3D construction. That means there's no one kind of being educated on it. You know, people go to get a mechanical engineer degree to build cars. There's no one kind of setting that foundation. We're working on that foundation right now, but it's going to take a year or so to really get to the, the course to the classrooms. And that's going to be the biggest thing is making sure that we have the next generation coming into the construction field. And I hope people listen to my story of, hey, how I entered it. It was old, boring, and I didn't like it to now, like Ian said, I wake up every day and I love what I do. It's super exciting. We really get to go kind of explore all the way from here to really all the way to the moon, as we say. <laughs> and speaking of uh, that, you know, I, I think um, NASA did a competition on uh, building 3D printed uh, homes or uh, structures on, on Mars. When do you think we'll see the first structure outside Earth? <laughs> You know, as as our CEO Henrik says, let's master building on Earth first, and then we'll, we'll take it to space. <laughs> no, I, I think that one of the most important things in this sector right now, we were really, really careful on press and media until we had something out of the ground. And that is not a common approach in 3D printing right now. There's a new group every day that says they're going to do something that no one else has done, and, and they're going to be the ones who transform it. And then when you look at what's actually deployed, I mean, I think Cobot's probably responsible for most of the actual structures in the world. And so I think the approach of doing first and then claiming later is really important. And uh, one of the things that attracted me to Cobot and one of the things we try to do at NIDUS is make sure that we are delivering on what we say we can do. So when we call you up and tell you that we're going to build on the moon, we're absolutely going to be building on the moon. <laughs> 
Thank you so much, Ian and, and Vincent. And I hope your partnership takes you to the moon one day uh, soon. And uh, you know, thanks again for your time and sharing your experience and expertise with our audience. This was an, a very, very uh, interesting talk, and I really enjoyed uh, talking with you, both of you and, and listening and uh, hearing your feedback on the 3D printed concrete structures and how this industry is evolving uh, in the short term and long term. Thank you so much for your time and being with us today. Thank you. Thank you for having us.